folks. Welcome. Welcome to DFA Spark Series. Happy Wednesday. Um, my name is Alden Burke. Uh, I am glad that you all are joining us today for the Spark Series. I want to, as folks are coming in, if you have the chance, um, please feel free to share your sort of name, pronouns, where you're calling in from in the chat so we can see. We also love when folks' cameras are on so we can get a sense of who we're here with. But of course, no worries um, if that's an issue. Um, I'm really excited for our talk today. Um, today, we're featuring Laura Forlano and Deepa Butulia. And uh, before we get started, I want to do some Zoom norming and just go over what the run of show will look like. Um, so if everyone, uh, folks are coming in, we'll keep you muted for the presenters. Again, if you want to share your cameras, we'd love to see you. Um, closed captioning is available for this session. If you go down to the bottom sort of right hand corner, you should see a closed captioning option. This session is also being recorded. It will be shared out on our Design for America YouTube channel. Um, everyone who signed up for the event, um, I'll send an email afterwards with the recording, the playlist that we had from today, um, the presentation decks, and then some resources that Laura and Deepa share with us throughout this session. Um, the other thing I want to invite everyone to do as the session is going on, and Laura and Deepa are sharing their thoughts and knowledge and tools and resources for folks to use the chat to ask questions, share resources as well. Um, Laura and Deepa will both present out and then be in conversation with each other, and they'll sort of use the chat to um, source any of the questions that you all want to ask. Um, yeah, and so for uh, the DFA Spark series, I see a lot of people who have been in here before, but as an overview, this is our Design for America's weekly webinar series. It's really this semester thinking through resilient communities, something that's been really exciting as a sort of natural thematic that has come about over the last few weeks is this idea of speculative futures. Um, how do we as designers think about creating more equitable worlds um, and how do we fold that into our design practice and so the first session that we had which um, I can share in the chat uh, was with Fritz Desir who also was thinking about these speculative futures and um, what are the tools and the sort of frameworks that we're using to explore that. I'm very excited to continue this conversation with Laura and Deepa um, and with that I'm going to pass it to Laura and Laura's gonna uh, take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Alden and Design for America for hosting us today. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. Um, so I'm just gonna give you the highlights of this um, presentation around making critical more than human futures. Uh, so you have some images and some sense of the kind of work I do so that when we move into the conversation um, across Deepa's work and my work that we you have some images in your head of what that might look like. Um, and I'm gonna go fairly quickly. Um, so, you know, I've, I've worked on a number of different projects throughout my career. I'm trained originally as a social scientist and then been working as a design researcher for about the, the last 10 years. And I've done edited book projects in a number of different areas, including social computing, science and technology studies and design, and really trying to you know, bring together uh, conversations uh, from critical theory and the social sciences together with generative design methods. And um, I really started out my career, you know, in the year 2004, I was actually in an elevator in Budapest and a senior member of my field asked me um, you know, what I was gonna study for my dissertation. And I said, I was gonna study the wireless internet. And that was you know, in 2004. And he said, you can't study something that doesn't exist. And so that became kind of my quest throughout my career was to figure out what were the, the sites I could go to, the, the people that I could study, that I could get a window into you know, people, things, and societies that don't exist yet. And that's what really brought me to design and to design futures in particular. Um, so I, you know, the, the theme of the future has come up at all of my field sites in recent years, uh, from the driverless city test bed at UMich um, to the Pratt Make the Future Here um, design accelerator. Um, but I'm really interested again in this idea of critical futures. 
critical futures um, bringing together critical theory with speculative futures. And I'm also very interested in approaches around feminist futures, uh, justice, data feminism, and, and critical scholarship around disability, for example, in terms of reimagining more pluriversal worlds. So here's kind of a diagram that gives you a sense. Um, I built this on Stuart Candy's model for the ladder, uh, futures laddering, uh, the idea that design fiction and experiential futures are some of the generative ways that futurists and designers are working. Um, but to that, I kind of added this category of design anthropology where projects might be more analytical um, and less exploratory. So I'm trying to, you know, here kind of make sense of and organize these different kinds of practices that I've been involved in over the years. Um, and I'm doing a lot of writing around this idea of the more than human or the post-human, um, other than human, um, both in terms of what do these languages provide us in terms of futuring. So uh, the idea here being that we need to learn other ways of living with both emerging technologies as well as natural environment that are more relational. So rather than thinking about the human as a discrete individual subject that's kind of separate from the world, we have to be more um, engaged with the ways in which our participation in the world with uh, technologies and with um, plants, animals, microbes, and the natural environment are, are more relational, meaning that they are dependent on one another. Um, so if you see this traditional kind of human-centered design approach that we use that many of you I'm sure are very familiar with, this is about moving to the consideration of our relationships with the non-human, potentially uh, thinking about non-users, thinking about multiple um, identities that we might have as people, uh, intersectional oppression, for example, as you know, one example where something like race and ability come together in our experience of the world, uh, moving towards more cooperative and collaborative um, forms of designing, and thinking about users um, both not only as the subjects of our research, but also as participants in things like speculative futuring. Um, and finally, moving towards uh, the dominant understanding of a user as a consumer to other, um, other types of engagement, such as the work of repair. And I know Deepa is going to talk more about that in her presentation. Um, so I'll just now show you some images that came out of some of the collaborative projects I've done. All of my work does tend to be collaborative because I'm trained as a social scientist, as I said. So I'm often, you know, working with um, architects and fashion designers and um, lots of, you know, people who who are able to really bring some of these critical and speculative visions um, together. Um, so the Driverless City Project is a project that we did at IIT with the funding of the NIAR Prize, the initial uh, year of that NIAR Prize. So we were. Um, it's not really funded by the university to work in a, an interdisciplinary team. And one of the, the mind maps that we created as part of that project, thinking through the social implications of autonomous vehicles, was actually published in the New York Times um, as part of one of their design issues. Um, and you can read more about that in this article on picturing the self-driving city. Um, and also as part of that project, we built, um, again, kind of playing with you know, some of the things we've seen in the futures field, things like um, the, the card decks that are, are widely available. We sort of took that concept, but then um, turned it into this uh, 100 token sort of ideation set with different kinds of keywords that you could manipulate to create different kinds of stories and scenarios um, called the scenario builder. Um, working with uh, a, an industrial designer named Mark, Martin Kastner in uh, Chicago. Um, another completely different project was on the future of work with support of the Open Society Foundations. Um, this work was done with Megan Halpern. Um, and this was a project that actually used a speculative historical game um, in which we created gameplay that went 3000 years into history. And the idea here was that it opened up history as a speculative space through which social and economic justice um, uh, advocacy organizations could kind of be free of the constraints of their everyday work and instead think, you know, historically about the role of technology and uh, the future of work and sort of how how technologies and humans, you know, have had 
you know, the ways in which um, humans and te technologies have, let's say, co-evolved over time. Um, and that led to then a half day session that was also about kind of creating these alternative prototypes for future technologies that would kind of protect and, um, you know, would be intended to um, serve the, the workers that social and economic justice groups that participated. So, so this idea of building these um, low fidelity prototypes as a way of working together to imagine alternative possible features of work. Um, another project is a computational fashion project. And this one was with two fashion designers, um, Mina Cow and Amy Sperber. And we, we used essentially a 3D, you know, 3D printing and um, generative design methods to create this um, 3D printed men's dress shirt. Um, and, and the point of this project was to really experiment with sort of digital materiality, the way that um, the digital and the physical come together and sort of the role of craft and computation. And so it was, you know, very different approach. Um, and, you know, it was uh, about learning how to work with uh, these machines as a way of kind of create generating, um, you know, alternative possible uh, uh, fashion from the future, let's say. Um, and finally, the project that I've been working on most recently, this idea of, you know, um, my own identity as a type one diabetic and thinking about what it means to live with AI-driven medical devices. Um, and I've written about this, um, you know, drawing on autoethnographic methods um, in an article um, in which I kind of make this point that while this AI system is keep keeping me alive, it's also ruining my life. Um, and I've written about that in an article in public books called The Danger of Intimate Algorithms, if you're interested in that. Um, and lastly, the, this project, um, as part of that research, working with a uh, fashion designer, uh, Sky Kubakub in Chicago, who runs Rebirth Garments and to kind of prototype this bathing suit that is sort of to accommodate um, you know, the insulin pump and, and thinking about questions around privacy and chronic illness um, and sort of what it means to you know, go about everyday you know, life, like mundane everyday situations, such as going to the beach when you have that crypt um, identity, for example. Um, so these are all very different projects. And I would say that they touch on speculation in quite different ways. Some of them are more participatory. Some of them look like prototypes. Um, but they are all about trying to bring together that critical theory from the social sciences into conversation with generative design methods. Um, and I think in terms of my um, orientation, um, I think about you know, the role of positionality that we as designers really need to make our, um, our positionality more explicit to sort of what identities do we hold and how does that impact our design work and what kinds of futures we imagine um, and what kind of alternative possibilities um, to acknowledge you know, in the feminist theory vein that everyone has partial knowledge. And I think that sort of underpins some of the uh, participatory design approaches that, that sort of stakeholders are coming with knowledge um, and to, to sort of move beyond our um, typical human-centered design relationship with technologies and tools and towards an understanding of living with socio-technical systems and really in these relational cultures. And so that's kind of what I think of as my research program around making critical futures. Um, it's, you know, it is fairly, fairly broad and expansive and multi-scalar and, you know, inventive in different ways. But I, um, again, you know, the, the core theme there is really about how can we bring together, you know, critical theory and speculative uh, futures work. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Deepa before we uh, have a cross-cutting conversation about that. Thank you, Laura. I'll share my screen quickly. Oh. Um, I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm not able to see my, uh, hold on a second. Yeah, now I see it. Okay. Um,
Okay, uh, so thank you, Laura, for that presentation. It was really amazing. Uh, and I'm glad to come after and sort of give this alternative uh, perspective to the uh, for, for, with regards to the work I do in the same space. Um, and so, so yes, my name is Deepa Butulia. Uh, I am assistant professor at STM School of Art and Design, which is at the University of Michigan uh, in this place called Ann Arbor in Michigan. So the thumb uh, at the bottom of the thumb, if you look at the map of the Michigan um, state. Anyways, uh, so yes, um, most of you must be guessing that by now. And since I get that asked a lot, I thought I should answer that question. Uh, I am from India in a, a, a city called Nagpur and where I got all my earlier education. So my, uh, which was from architecture and then uh, industrial design. And then I moved to US, which is my new home uh, and has have been here ever since, um, I think it was 2009. And then I got my MFA from UIC and then um, got my PhD from Carnegie Mellon. So that has been my trajectory and design journey. Uh, what my research areas, so uh, based on, well, since we are in this space, so uh, you might have guessed by now, but um, uh, as part of many other projects and uh, perspectives, uh, one of the most important things that I'm really passionate about and I study and I'm immersed into is the uh, way of the examples of futurities, the way we think about futures uh, with a capital, uh, with an S, not a capital S, with an S, uh, which are more non-linear and non-Western, and they are rooted in design and making, especially in the context of speculative and critical design. And uh, sort of how I came to this topic, um, again, uh, when I came to Chicago for my master's, uh, I, was, uh, I was studying under Bruce Tharp and Stephanie Tharp, who are known for discursive design, if you guys are familiar with that term. And uh, that's how I got interested in this whole space. But for someone being from uh, two different continents, two cultures and uh, experiences, I found it um, that all my education, all my life has been shaped by very heavy Western thought. And uh, it, even in even being in India, a lot of the books we were studying were written by Western authors, the concepts we were uh, uncritically examining and just swallowing because it comes from the mighty West. Um, uh, so we were never taught to question those things. And so we thought, you know, this is like, this is what we should know. This is if you need to be, uh, abreast with what's happening in the field. And so when I started my master's here, uh, I was a bit frustrated with what was going on, uh, even though it was fascinating, but I, I couldn't really relate to. And like Laura said, uh, when I was asked, what do you want to do for your PhD? I said, I want to study Jugar, <laughs> which is basically what um, my all my research and work revolves around. So it's a Hindi term. Hindi is um, the main language in India. Uh, and, and basically it's pronounced Jubar. Uh, it kind of um, uh, means sort of local ingenuity, DIY with limited resources, um, sort of a quick fix. It's more of a mindset. Uh, it's part of a culture similar to music or food. You know, it's, it's been practiced at different scales with different intentions. Um, so I cannot just say that one little hack is a jogar. It could be anything. Um, and so it's, it's kind of like, like I said, it's a practice, it's a mindset, and it's very pervasive, and it's understood in various ways. Uh, and there's a whole ecology of it. So I've been studying about it and, and kind of um, based on my interest and my exposure to speculative and critical design, I started questioning like what, what it means, you know, like this is this uh, one practice, which is very high expertise uh, design niche practice versus this everyday bottom up grassroots level practice with uh, no, uh, no recognition or validation in design uh, discipline. And so I wanted to marry them together and see what emerges out of that. And so, uh, so basically I started looking more deeply than what my cultural mind has trained me to look at it in ways of like, it was just a way of life, you know? I mean, yes, let's uh, figure out something. So that's how we will say, um, you know, jugaad karte hai. So, uh, but I started thinking more deeply now in, in more, uh, more design and design future sense. 
And I thought the most, uh, since we're talking about resilient communities, the most value this practice has, uh, has given to the culture. And not only I'm talking about South Asia, but this practice can be found across many um, developing countries and even let's say the term global South, so to speak, it's, it can be found in places where there are less resources and more resiliency. So I think the most value this practice has created uh, in terms of creating resilient communities is through this idea of DIY making. And um, so how we would recognize in a much more Western sense is with a space that we can call maker space. And that's what comes to mind immediately, right? Maker space, make magazine, maker fairs, hackathons, all that sort of uh, stuff in which a bunch of white engineers are using tools and Arduinos and 3D printers and building stuff. Um, but growing up in, in, in a culture in which we are uh, really um, in good relationship with the objects we own and we want to have a long-term relationships with them. And so um, our culture is full of spaces uh, where you can easily get anything fixed. And I never uh, for a second thought that this would not be a part of the future. And so flash forward um, to 20 years where I got to, uh, or 20 years or so, um, um, and I, I and these places still exist, like this exact place near my house where you can get things repaired. And so I started thinking about, um, you know, the value that Jugar creates in terms of making and creating resilient communities is through these repair spaces. So that's what we need to look at uh, in terms of a design community or a speculative futures community or um, as concerned citizens about the future that the value that this DIY practices create are not in the maker spaces, but in the repair spaces. That is what makes, because it not only creates um, income through informal economy uh, situations, but it also provides tools for people to um, own or take more ownership in the objects they use um, and, and have that committed relationship with the objects. Um, and then the idea of maker spaces is not just limited to fixing uh, mixture grinders and pressure cookers in, in the, like in the case, but um, in, in a more sense, I started looking at what are these practices here that are contributing to making the communities more resilient and are also um, giving us pathways for looking at futures in a much more uh, inclusive, um, um, anti-racist, speculative futures, so to speak. And so for, for example, this uh, project here, this is, uh, I, this is called Gearing Up Bicycles as a link uh, Alden can share. It's a practice in DC. Uh, and what they do is they not only help uh, or help people repair their bicycles, but they train youth especially the inner city disenfranchised youth um, from the African American population. And they train them in fixing their bikes and make them more employable, even at those hipster uh, bike repair shops, because they, this is, these are the places where they're getting the knowledge and the training to make their futures better. So again, uh, a situation where repair spaces are building the futures and not maker spaces. Deepa, I'm going to um, just quickly interrupt you. I'm sorry. I think you're sharing slides, but it's not being reflected in what we're seeing. Uh, oh. Okay, let me. Because I know you're going into examples, so I want to make sure that also folks are seeing the, the beautiful slides that you have. Um, let me know. If... Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah. Okay. I want to go back. So was I, was all of this not seen? Mm -mm. Okay, so anyways, um, I might just, you know, show you all the Thank slides you. I have. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right, so this is the repair space from my community growing up in India that I was talking about, where you can get almost anything fixed. Um, and they, these are low resource, they don't have access to all the tools, but they have immense knowledge, like you can get anything fixed or made in an hour. Um, and then the, as I was talking about importance of repair spaces as against the idea of maker spaces. And this is the example I was sharing about gearing up bicycles. Uh, now is it moving? 
Perfect. So, so yes, when we are here uh, gathering, thinking about speculative futures, uh, and for design community, uh, much of the root of the term speculative future is rooted in this idea of speculative design, critical design, design future, design fictions, etc. And these is this is the, like the canon of literature that comes to um, our mind. Like you know, yes, all this right here, it's been coded. And so again, I, as I said, I was a bit frustrated with the structuring and I was looking at these do not speak or represent anything um, about resilient communities or communities where I come from or where people have learned to live with existing systems um, and have uh, have created practices that are much more uh, rooted in, in the uh, sort of understanding similarities and understanding in the culture. Uh, and I, I found that these jugar like making practices, they are much more critical uh, rather than the criticality that's been shown to us or uh, has been presented to us in uh, sort of the critical design uh, projects like the Dun & Raby sort of, um, um, you know, uh, John Ray, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, and so I thought these practices are much more critical. They come from um, a, a, a a need to be much more um, resilient, uh, relying on themselves for, um, uh, I'm just kind of missing, not having my words at the moment, but, but, they, but they are relying on themselves and their tools and these critical making practices to fight the oppression. And that's what Jubar was. Uh, when, when, when India was colonized for a few hundred years and were imposed with all these imperial, systems and procedures and bureaucracies. Uh, and even after they left, uh, the same thing was done by capitalism. And people had no idea how to deal with that because that was not the way uh, we were supposed to live. And so Jugar was a, a response to that oppression. And Jugar is a tool people use to face oppression and subvert it in very crit creative and critical ways. And so I thought like this is such a beautiful practice that speaks about not only speculative futures, but also uh, about resilient communities. Uh, and, and of course, there is a whole world out there that kind of talks about alternatives to this uh, mainstream speculative and critical design practice. And my job as an educator and researcher is to make these um, uh, alternatives more visible, to give voice to these practices that are otherwise marginalized in the mainstream conversations on design. And I'm so glad that I get to present this to something called Design for America, because even if it's about marginalized communities, it is much more relevant, especially to America, where more and more people, regardless of race and class, are getting disenfranchised because of the political divisions and uh, and the e-commerce um, supported capitalism and um, all and and the likes of that, and uh, also what has um, and it's not just these. Uh, avant-garde practices that are provocative, and I'm not just, just trying to replace it with my vision of it, but it's more sustainable. So it's not just a future where we are thinking of uh, what do we do with old technologies or what, how do we use found objects, but there are some nuggets of wisdom in that culture and that practice, and that also has pathways uh, and visions for a much more sustainable futures for everybody. Um, and, and if you want to, if you're more interested in the works people are doing that I think relate to this practice that I term critical Jugar, I find work of Cyrus Kabiru, uh, who makes uh, these Afrofuturist eye sculptures, eyewear sculptures out of found objects, which is, uh, um, and he kind of relates it back to practice in Kenya, where he's from. Uh, called Juakali, which basically means, which is like a similar practice to Jugar. Um, and so this is the framework, and I, I, I think it's great that Laura had a similar framework, so I can maybe show that here. Um, how I position this practice and how I see this practice is, um, yes, we have all these practices where we have this very pragmatic conventional design practice, practice 
and it has its own value and place. It's similarly, a speculative design, critical design, even though I'm being critical of it, I'm not saying they're completely useless. Yes, there is so much value in thinking and using those practices, but we should also be much more sympathetic. And when we are saying inclusive, we should really have equal space and equal stage for practices like Jubar and critical Jubar because they are also rooted in making and creativity and uh, bringing community together and treating uh, the maker as a knowledgeable uh, person who participating in the process. Uh, and so I see critical Jubar as a very frugal and decolonial practice to visualize speculative futures. Uh, and there's much more to it and you're welcome uh, to email me or have an offline chat with me about this practice if you're interested. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's all I have to share for now. I, I know I'm going over a little over perhaps, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Great, um, thank you so much. I think we have about 15 minutes or a little bit less for discussion. So I have a couple of questions um, that we can discuss. and. I'll read them out in case they pique people's interest, but we're also very curious about what questions you have for us. So maybe you can put those questions in the chat and we can also read through those questions. Um, so thinking, thank you so much, Deepa. I was so glad that you're able to join. It's so wonderful to really have this rich conversation about you know, what um, it's in a way, in a sense, you know, um, critical design is an alternative to sort of affirmative design or tr traditional yeah. human-centered design, but we're talking about the alternative to the alternative design, right? Because looking at something like crypt, crypt futures and disability, or looking at Jugad futures, and, and you know, it's really going in, in a really different directions. Um, so the questions that I have here are, you know, in what ways are these capacities of critique, you know, in tension with abilities for imagining? Um, how might we think about participation with respect to speculative futures and who, who gets to future? Um, and what, how do the forms of this work, uh, the forms and formats and aesthetics of speculative futures relate to the intended audiences for our work? Um, and how can we build more capacity for speculation uh, more broadly in society? And what are the challenges in communicating that speculative work. I know, you know, for me, I'm um, having, you know, now, uh, you know, done a number of projects that touch on these, I still find it very difficult to communicate to um, audiences, uh, whether that be professionals or academics, like what the value of the work is and how to, how to understand and read the work, I think is, is quite difficult um, because people are more, to, uh, familiar with a traditional human-centered design problem and solution framing, or they're more familiar with certain kinds of, of language, certain kinds of models. And these projects quite destabilize that. It's like you can't quite put your finger on exactly what they're doing and how they're doing it. So that those are sort of the, you know, it's a long list of questions, but just to, to open up the conversation, I wonder, Deepa, if you had any thoughts about you know any one of those questions, or um, and I can paste them in the chat as well, um, yeah. or someone who's here with us today might also have some other questions. Yeah, I would like to address the who gets to future um, question. Uh, because exactly that is what is at the heart of the work I do. Uh, intentionally, it, uh, I mean, uh, initially it was um, the same question, like who is really deciding the futures of people? Because yes, speculative design, speculative futures design fiction is a great practice, but it is um, it is very much rooted in a Western uh, sort of middle class, very heteronormative, cisgendered, uh, white male as the center of all these futures in most cases. In most cases. I know there are some exceptions and uh, there's some wonderful work people like you are doing, Laura. Uh, but this this is what, I mean, back in sort of 2012, 2014, this is what, what, what was going on, uh, where all my work um, and my curiosity stemmed from. And I think this is a really good question to ask who gets to future. And one of the ways um, 
is like letting people, uh, you know, like how they say that if you go with a camera in the field and take pictures, it's your gaze. It's like looking down on the subject versus giving them the camera and letting them decide uh, how would they do it with a little uh, sympathetic guidance in terms of, um, you know, like this other tools. How would you, how do you intend to future? How do you see yourself? Uh, and and for me, it has been looking at practices like Jugar and giving it a critical lens is a way that I still let them let the practices coming from uh, grassroots and bottom up uh, making practices, let, uh, let them be authentic, let them be genuine because there's no formula for it. But at the same time, um, legitimizing it and making it visible. That's how I uh, I think I participate in who gets to future um, situation and everybody could have their own visions and versions of it. But I think it's high time uh, we let people design their own futures and we use the privilege we have as academia, uh, as, as uh, educators and in academia, um, give them voice and place to um, show their practices. And of course, at the same time, there are artists like Cyrus Kabiru who are doing that already uh, and also being very proud of it. Uh, so I think we need more and more of those alternatives being given space and voice uh, in this mainstream. Um, yeah, one of the things that struck me seeing your presentation, Deepa, is about the temporal boundaries of the future. And I think that that's one way also the future of work project I presented, which because it went 3000 years into history, it's often right. recognized as a futures project. Right. Um, and so it is true that I think a lot of the perhaps critical design approaches, they, they tend to fixate on particular temporal frames and say, well, what about 100 years in the future or what about this kind of future or that? And I wonder, how do you see the work of the artists that you showed with the eyeglasses? Like, how do you understand that from the perspective of, of like temporality, for example? Yeah, yeah. I mean, temporality is such a, like the linear temporality is a very Western concept, the idea of calendars and tomorrow and future. It is like rooted in the language. But if you, uh, I heard this talk from Pupul Bisht, uh, who is another um, um, speculative researcher of Indian origin who, who kind of beautifully laid out the idea that in Indian language, the word for yesterday and tomorrow is the same, we say kal. And in the conversation, somebody figures out if I'm talking about yesterday or, or the coming day. And so the idea of time in many culture is circular. Um, and this linearity is built into the futurities we imagine, and it's been heavily guided by media and uh, speculative fiction writings. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's really important for me that we have these alternatives like the, from the indi indigenous communities, um, looking at work like Chicana futurism, uh, in which, if you know the work of, um, what was her uh, name? Um, Chicana futurism. I'm trying to Ramirez. I think I've shared the link with Alden. Um, you know, she works with these uh, Hispanic um, uh, images and idols of saints, and then she uses discarded electronics to make the same uh, for a contemporary version. So there is this link between, um, you know, cultural practices, what they value as a culture that's been going on for ages, versus uh, making a commentary on. Um, you know, like these um, spaces we live in, in which we have this access of uh, electronic waste. And then so, so I think the Chicana futurism very beautifully connects uh, these ideas of temporality. And there are so many similarities between African future, Afrofuturism and Chicana futurism. And they are all uh, especially similar to uh, the ideas of South Asian uh, vision of uh, or, or understanding of time, they also have this non-linear approach to temporality. Um, and so, so I think it's all about making sure that we are also giving similar value to a non-linear vision of futurity uh, versus more linear. Yeah, that that's wonderful. It really makes a lot of sense. Um, 
does anyone have questions that they wanted to pose? I think we have about three to five more minutes um, before we need to wrap up. Would love to hear you know, what you all are thinking about and specific questions you might have for us. I did wanna also mention um, that we started off this talk with uh, some music. So those of you who joined at the top of the hour might've heard some live, you know, some, some music from uh, the band Drexia. Um, this is a Detroit uh, techno band that's very strongly tied to Afrofuturism. Um, they, in their musical tradition, basically they have a myth about an underwater utopian community um, that was, you know, in their in their story, you know, th this idea that their um, that people were that pregnant women were essentially dumped off of slave ships, but then gone undersea to form a utopian community, and that's that storyline is is woven throughout, and it's been so um, you know really resonated with creatives and artists that there's now also I think a graphic novel about that story. So it became a speculative future of its own. And it's fascinating. Um, it's come up in some research that I'm doing for a book project um, on cyborgs, you know, because it, it came up uh, because of the experimentation that musicians have with drum machines and different kinds of technologies. Um, so I thought I would tie that back to our conversation. And also the work of a, an artist, Alicia B. Wormsley, um, has a billboard project that's in Philadelphia, but also around the country, I just saw a garbage can in New York with the slogan, you know, there are black people in the future. And I think it does, again, go back to like, who gets to future and, you know, how I, I think it's fascinating that artists and musicians um, and activists actually, um, their visions and their works are really, it's uh, very, very inspiring. And um, it's really at the edges of perhaps, you know, traditional design practice, right? It's really coming from a different place experimentally. Um, and even though critical design clearly draws on the artistic uh, vision, there are, you know, I think we, w there's no lack of imagination for what alternative possible visions of the future. Like those ideas are really out there, but they're not in places where companies are looking and, and, and they shouldn't be extracted and exploited, but but the point is that, you know, I think activist visions of the future are constantly about, you know, created alternative possible worlds that are, that, that are, you know, to quote uh, Arturo Escobar's design for the pluriverse, you know, worlds where many worlds fit, you know, and that um, it really opens up uh, an opportunity for the field of design. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. One. There's one question I would like to address uh, in the chat, which says, where, we can, where can we all DFA students go to learn incorporate Jubar mindsets in their design work with their local communities? How is it similar or different from prototyping? So again, um, Jubar mindset is born more out of uh, necessity and uh, situation, and it's very contextual. It is not uh, another formula that you can go and incorporate. That's something we need to also understand that everything is not up there, out there for consumption and, uh, you know, incorporation and, uh, you know, co-opting. Uh, sometimes it's uh, just important that it is, it is just because it exists uh, as a very live legitimate practice. And again, the idea of comparing it to prototyping is also I struggle a lot to explain people. Um, design is, we are especially talking about industrial design, it was um, rooted, the, I mean, if you look at the history of it, it became, it came into into existence, uh, it became a serious legitimate practice because of industrial revolution and, and the machine age. Uh, and, uh, and then the whole field was born that was essentially in service of industry. That is what an industrial designer did or does. And the prototype uh, prototyping is a part of that colonial structure in which uh, this whole field was constructed. So yes, you can prototype and it might be similar to uh, a, what looks like a Jugar practice, but after your investigation in the design process of the prototype, you're gonna toss it away. Whereas the prototype that you tossed away is a real thing 
uh, for somebody and very valuable and very meaningful and they are proud of it because they were able to create it with less resources. So I think that's like the biggest difference. It's your uh, a, a practice or a word called prototyping that you are able to do because of the privilege you experience is very different from a practice that a person is doing because of the lack of privilege they experience. Uh, so that's like a really big difference and uh, uh, recognizing that and acknowledging that and bringing that into your visions of future if you are interested in speculative futures practice, um, if you are ever in a position of making policies so making you know making sure that these practices are noticed for future policies would be a good way to incorporate that mindset in your work great so i think that we're probably about at time um, but we look forward to continuing the conversation with you all so feel free to get in touch with us um, I think our information will be posted on the website um, and I think we're pretty easy to find online. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alden and we'll wrap up today's session. Yeah, uh, first and foremost, Deepa and Laura, I just really wanna thank you for such a fruitful conversation today. Um, from both of your perspectives, I think there's a lot. Yeah, I, I also love this question of like, yeah, who is futuring, who's doing that work? It also made me think of like, who's also like, allowed to be a critic or like what is criticality too and this sort of like pushing up against I think a lot of what y'all were talking about this notion of expertise um, as well so that's something that I'm going to take with me um, moving forward yeah some two things I want to quickly plug um, this conversation uh, the DFA Sparks series will continue next Wednesday um, a sort of similar segue into thinking about futuring but sort of thinking about it in work and the workplace and what does the future of work look like for uh, specifically young people specifically in the context of this past year so that we'll have a spark session on that next Wednesday and I'm going to share the chat and then that conversation continues um, on April 20th uh, as a sort of workshop that we're hosting um, in collaboration with Steelcase um, as an organization thinking about the futuring of some workspaces so uh, join us for those. Again, thank you, Deepa and Laura. We'll follow up with